week or two ago, I read somewhere, someone said to me there were some um, Christians saying they didn't like this song, that song, Reckless Love of God, didn't like the term reckless love of God, saying because God's love is not reckless, and I can't remember all the uh, reasoning behind it, but if you even think about that song, you know, he said he'll leave the 99 and come looking for each of us as individuals, J Jesus, you know, said that. Also, it says there's no mountain he won't climb up. I'm not, I'm not, there may be even a psalm or a verse of scripture that says that, but that idea that, you know, uh, that Jesus would climb to the top of Mount Everest to save one of us, you know, that God's love is, is so overwhelming. I, I would say if you, um, if, if you have any struggles with that idea, the reckless love of God, read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, not right the second, but... Um, <laughs> Today, when you go home, and Ephesians chapter 2 says, you know, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And then it goes on to say, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And so then it goes on, in the coming ages, he will show us the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So it is a, um, a you know, never-ending, reckless love of God and God's love for us, each and every one of us, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, God's love never fails. And so hopefully we'll all hold on to that and know that um, today and, and really each and every day of our lives. There was, a, many of you know, a few weeks ago, there was the NFC Championship game and the New Orleans Saints played the Los Angeles Rams, and it, got, it was a close game, and it got down to the end, and the Saints were winning, and the referees blew a, fo a call that was obvious that they blew the call, and um, it was actually two penalties should have been called, and they didn't call them, and you know really it changed the outcome of the game, and the Saints ended up losing, and the Rams ended up winning, and some people say, well, one call can't make a difference, and yeah, it can. It did in that game anyway. So, yeah, there was a whole game to play, but that, that call made a difference. Drew Brees is the quarterback for the New Orleans Saints. And um, I, I don't know, like a few days after that happened, I don't know, he was on the news or something. I heard him interviewing him, and they asked him what he thought about it. And he said, you know, it was pretty, pretty upsetting because it, it, you know, it was a bad call. And then he said, you know, you control what you can. <laughs> And then you just have to go forward from there and move on. And I knew I was going to be preaching today on the serenity prayer. And I thought, you know, that's, that's what the serenity prayer says. You, you control what you can and what you can't. You just have to, to move on. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to distinguish one from the other, to know one from the other. A favorite Christian song of mine for almost 10 years. By the way, if it's, Carrie, if it's chilling here, I don't know what the heater, the thermostat says back there, but it, usually on Sunday mornings I notch it up a little bit and I forgot to today, so I'm not sure what that says, but is everybody else okay? Maybe it's just me. I don't know. It seems kind of chilly in here. So um, the, um, a favorite song of mine from about 10 years ago is, and I've mentioned it before, it's called The Motions by Matthew West. And he says, I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to live one more day without your all-consuming passion inside of me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I had given everything instead of going through the motions? Martin Luther King Jr. had a quote. Someone gave this to me the other day. It was cut out of the paper. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? To me, those two things tie in, the song and this quote tie in very well together. You know, I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to keep asking myself, what if I had given everything instead of going through the motions? And then this um, question from Martin Luther King Jr., life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And the person that gave this to me said it was a reminder if we're not doing something for others, we need to get doing something for others. That's a, that's a call, God's call on our lives as Christians. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know one from the other. 
A few weeks ago, a law was passed in New York State and then celebrated. And for many of us, it made us cringe and made us literally sick to our stomachs. It's, in my opinion, evil, and I don't use that term lightly. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know one from the other. Yesterday, Ann and I had a conversation. We were visiting with uh, another Christian couple, and we talked about lots of things, and then um, they talked about um, immig immigrants and refugees, and we didn't really know the difference, and uh, asylum seekers, and we, we, we just didn't know about that. And there was so much that we didn't know and, or understand, and we learned a lot more yesterday. There's still a lot more that, a lot that we don't know, but we learned a lot about it yesterday. And, you know, I've been asked many times, and some of you uh, have asked me probably, um, why I don't speak on, preach on political issues more? And some of you are just like cringing, don't do that. <laughs> and, uh, and I've said there, there are a couple reasons. One reason is, I just don't see any benefit in it. I don't think, I think it would cause more harm than good. So that's, that's one reason. And a second reason, which may even be more important is, I just don't know, you know. I'm not a real big political guy. I, I try to kind of keep aware of what's going on, but I don't know behind the scenes. I don't know that, you know, these issues, there's so much to them and I, I don't really know. And so I don't like to speak or try to speak to things that I just really don't know. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom, the wisdom to know one from the other, and the wisdom to know when not to speak up. A few years ago, a Disney movie came out called Frozen, and I saw it once, I think part of it. I, not that it's a bad movie, it's just, you know, it's... Um, you know, our, we, our grandkids aren't really old enough yet. We're kind of in that middle place. And, uh, um, but there's a song in that movie that I liked a lot, Let It Go. A lot of, you know, also about the song about building a snowman. That's a nice song. But um, <laughs> that song, Let It Go, I have that on my phone. And over the last year or so, there have been times when I've listened to it a lot. <laughs> Just play it like over and over. And that's for a reason, you know, either things are going on, whether it's transitions here at the church or, um, you know, difficult times and, or, you know, maybe, you know, issues with somebody and just listen to that song. I thought it would help me to let it go, <laughs> but it's easier said than done. <laughs> it's easier sung than done. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things that I can and the knowledge to know one from the other. In the late 1930s, a group was forming to help those who were struggling with drinking, with you know, alcohol, that those who were either alcoholics or struggling with it. And it, it became known within a few years, there was kind of another um, group, and then it became known as Alcoholics Anonymous. In fact, I think the first official meaning of Alcoholics Anonymous by that name was either in Akron or Cleveland. It's in, in, uh, in Ohio, in Akron, Cleveland. Is that Akron? Is that in Akron? Okay, so um, it's always good to have a historian here. That's right. So, um, but at around that time, I don't think it was like from the very beginning, but in the early 1940s, so close to the time it began, there was a prayer that was printed in an obituary of someone, I don't even think they knew the person's name, and it was that the serenity prayer. And many think that a theologian named uh, Reinhold Niebuhr wrote it, and, and then, but the thoughts have been around really for a lot of years throughout the ages. And so, uh, but a person saw that that was involved in the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's, they said about it, they said, never, there's never been so much said about Alcoholics Anonymous in so few words. God, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know one from the other. And so that became just a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. And my understanding right now, there are about 100, Alcoholic Anonymous is in about 180 countries in the world, I think 118,000 groups roughly, with over 2 million people involved, and my understanding is that 
wherever it is that that prayer is prayed at every meeting. I, I'm pretty sure that's the case. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. None of us can change the past. <laughs> Sometimes we'd like to, and there's certain things we'd really like to change. None of us can change the past. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to step up and to go forward and change the things I can and the wisdom to know one from the other. For centuries, the Bible has been God's written word to all people, and especially for his people. God's truth, the truth. For Christians, it's our authority, it's our guide for our lives. Some things are very clear in the Bible, others are not real clear. Some issues were, that we have today were not issues in Bible times, and so the Bible doesn't speak to them directly, but we try to apply biblical principles to those issues. Biblical wisdom is discovered in reading the word and studying the word and, and, and reading you know, resources and studying the word with other people and worshiping with other Christians and, and, and just discussing and growing in the truth of God's word. It's so vitally important. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom, God's wisdom, to know one from the other. There's a passage that we're going to look at very briefly today, but to me it really captures the essence of the serenity prayer, or in a sense, in some ways, the serenity prayer captures the essence of, of this passage. Philippians 4, 1 through 13, many of us are familiar with this passage. For some, this passage contains your favorite Bible verse, right? Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But the whole passage, if we look at it, it says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And when he was writing these words, he's writing these words from jail. He was, he was put in jail for his faith. He had already been tortured and left for dead. He had already been, he, he had death threats against him at this time. His life was not easy at all at the time that he wrote this letter to the Philippian church. And he says, you know, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, Dear friends, that word for stand firm, it's a Greek word that was used of a soldier who was standing their ground and not just on post, you know, keeping guard when everything was quiet. It was a word that was used for a soldier who was standing their ground when the enemy was charging. That's what the, Paul, the term that Paul used that for us as Christians, stand firm, stand your ground, even in the face of the approaching enemy. Stand firm in the Lord with Jesus and for Jesus. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. It seems like these two ladies who were hard workers for the gospel, for the kingdom, they either had issues with, it seems like they had issues either with each other or some issue with the church. And, and he's saying for the sake of the gospel, you know, be of the same mind. Get along together, work things out. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. Contended at my side. It sounds to me like the serenity prayer. The courage to change the things that we can. The courage to change the things that we can. Along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. It sounds like Paul is saying, writing to them and saying, you know, you need to rejoice always. And just in case you missed that word always, I'm going to say it again, rejoice. Again, when Paul wrote these words, he had a lot of reasons not to be rejoicing. He didn't know when his life was going to be, he could have been, you know, he could have gotten the death sentence at any time. He had already been through so much, but he called them to rejoice Again, in the Lord. There's a quote from a, a, a Bible commentator, uh, William Barclay, who says this. It is the simple fact of human experience that a person living in the lap of luxury can be wretched. Now, this was written some years ago. 
It is a simple fact of human experience that a person living in the lap of luxury can be wretched and a person in the depths of poverty can overflow with joy. You think that's true? I do, you know. It doesn't say it's always like that, but it can be. He goes on to say, the secret is this. It is one of the basic laws of life that happiness depends not on things or on places, but always on persons. If we are with the right person, nothing else matters. And if we are not with the right person, nothing else can make up for that absence. In the presence of Jesus Christ, in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord, in the presence of Jesus Christ, the greatest of all friends and lovers is with us. Nothing can separate us from that presence, and in him, nothing can take away our joy. He's not speaking of happiness, you know, that revolves around our circumstances, but he's speaking of that deep down inner joy in the Lord, that, that blessed assurance that God is with us no matter what, that blessed assurance that we have an eternal hope, even if we whatever we're facing in this life, that God will never leave us, that God will never forsake us. It's that, it's that, that joy, that peace on the inside, that nothing on the outside can take away. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. God promises to never leave us or forsake us. This word that is used also, Paul is saying, Christ coming is near. They didn't know when it was going to happen. Those, those Christians in the first century, many of them thought that they will still be living when Christ returns. It will be 2,000 years. It's been 2,000 years since that time. It's a lot nearer now than it was then. Christ's coming is near. And, and he was saying that as an assurance, not as a, a bad thing, but Christ is coming as a good thing to rejoice and we will be with the Lord forever. And then in verse 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Those things that, are, that, that I'm so worried about, help me bring them before your throne. And again, we all know this is easier said than done. It's easier read than done. But God promises to be with us every step of the way. Before Jesus was crucified, on that night when he was with his disciples in the upper room, and he knew in just a, a few short hours, he knew what he was going to face. He knew the torture that was waiting for him. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And that same night, a little while later, he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. It was Jesus' promise to his disciples then, and it's his promise to his disciples now. In the first century, when these words were written, human beings had a lot of things to worry about. Life wasn't easy. In our world today, we have a lot of things going on. Life is not easy, and for some, it's a lot harder than for others. For Christians in the first century, life was very difficult. Again, their life could be on the line at any moment just because of their faith, just because they believed in Jesus. The peace of God which transcends understanding, that peace that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus when we're convinced of the truth of Romans 8, 28, 
that God does work all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Not that all things are good, but God, in, 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 some, in, in God's way, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. When we are convinced that God loves us and God loves each and every person and God knows and wants what's best for each and every person. When we are convinced that the words of Proverbs 3 are true, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of our ways acknowledge him and he will, he will direct our paths. Paul goes on to say, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know one from the other. Lord, help me to set my mind on the things above. Help me to set my heart on the things above. Help me to keep my mind and my, my heart focused on you. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. AA meetings, those that attend AA meetings, they are encouraged by one another, they learn from one another, they try to put it in practice through the help of one another. The things we have seen and learned, that wisdom, it's put it into practice. And the God of peace, that serenity that God can give, that God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am need. Paul is saying, thank you for the gift that you've given to help, help me out. Um, you know, Recently, I haven't been able to thank you. I either haven't had a messenger or I'm here in jail and I had no way to you know, get the message to you, but I, I appreciate all that you've done for me. And then he says, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And to me, this verse 11 and verse 12 and 13 really capture the essence of this. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in one. And Paul had experienced all those things. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. For some of you, that's your favorite scripture passage. For a lot of us, it's at least one of our favorite scripture passages. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. These two verses, these three verses, and they speak of serenity, they speak of wisdom, and they speak of courage. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, in Christ, through Christ, through his word, through worship, through that blessed assurance that God gives through the, our fellowship with other Christians, through God's provision, as he started this passage and said, stand firm. We can stand firm, even, even when the enemy and the opposition is charging right at us. We can stand firm because we can know that in the Lord, we can do all things through the Lord who gives us strength. About 10 years ago, or so, I'm not sure the date, we had a, a one of our Bible schools here, the theme was Jesus Down by the Sea. And Ann was the director at that time. And that Bible school, she, um, it was Jesus Down by the Sea, there was a story that was emphasized of um, the, the starfish that had all washed up onto the beach. And I remember she gave all the volunteers at Bible school um, something, I don't know what she gave them, but it had a, a, that, that story on there as well. And we talked about that, with, with, about serving with the kids, and then also we talked about it with the kids when, when they came to Bible school. The story of, you know, there are thousands of starfish that have washed up on a beach, and, you know, many of them can't get back into the water, and so they're going to die, and there's a, a little boy going along and picking up the starfish and walking them, you know, putting them back into the water, and then getting another one and, and, and taking it and putting it into the water, and there's an older man there and watching him and after a little while the older man who obviously was was kind of bitter about life said you know you're wasting your time 
You can't possibly help all of them. You're not making any difference at all. And the little boy didn't say anything to him. He just picked up another one, put it in the water, and said, I made a difference for that one. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know one from the other. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we pray that this prayer would be a reality in our lives. Many of us have things and situations and circumstances and decisions that we wish we could change. But none of us can change the past. Lord, some of us have current situations that that we wish we could change, but it just doesn't seem possible. Lord, any ways in which we can help others, any ways in which we can make a positive difference for our family, any ways in which we can take a step forward for your kingdom, for the good news, for sharing and living out the good news, Lord, help us to have the courage to take that step. The things, the people, the circumstances and the situations that we cannot change, Lord, give us the serenity to let it go. Lord, help us to have the wisdom through fellowship with other Christians, through worshiping together, through your word, through studying your word and growing in your word. Lord, help us through your your spirit speaking to our heart. Lord, help us to have the wisdom to distinguish one from the other. Lord, let us be open to your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. Today, even this moment, and each and every day as we live for you, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.